think that bards are having a renaissance right now. Media like D&D and The Witcher have brought them back into the limelight, but with all this hype, it's really easy to forget that before there was tossing coins to witchers and rolling for seduction, there was a centuries-long sacred bardic craft that shaped society as we know it today. I'm Jess, and I usually talk about Tolkien, but today I am so excited to get into bards, what they are, their history, and how they shaped society as we know it. So, what is a bard? To narrow it down to the most basic possible definition, a bard is a person who tells stories out loud. And by that definition, bards have existed, well, as long as civilization has. It's believed that we began to tell stories pretty much immediately after prehistoric language was first invented. Now, we weren't exactly reciting war and peace, but these first stories were fundamental for the development of early human society. When you needed to report back about the hunt you went on, to talk about when your wife gave birth or to warn somebody about that really weird mushroom you ate last week, you do it through a story. But beyond reporting real events, stories were used to begin trying to explain the unexplainable. Early man had no way of knowing that those little tiny lights up in the sky were actually superheated gigantic balls of gas hanging in the endless void of space. Instead, they used stories to help it make sense. For example, to say that some great benevolent being placed them there as a guidepost. Stories allowed early man to communicate with each other and to begin to find a place for themselves within the vast world. And of course, all of these stories were completely orally communicated. It's believed that language developed well over a hundred thousand years before even the, the simplest forms of writing, and so stories were transmitted from one person to another very differently than they are today. Instead of having one version of a tale forever cemented in the pages of a book, these stories were much more fluid. It's a lot like the children's game Telephone. You tell the guy next to you about how Jeremy killed a boar last week, and then three generations later, they're telling the tale of how the great Jeremy slayed the boar god Haflaxus on Midsummer's Eve. Oh, I'm such a good writer. Early stories existed only in memory, able to be changed minusculely by each person that told them. And so without writing to communicate and codify these stories, the storyteller was of utmost importance. They dictated precisely how events were remembered, how myth and legends developed, and even in prehistoric society, they saw them as important members of the community. Of course, when resources were really scarce back in the hunter-gatherer days, you couldn't exactly afford to have one guy sitting around and philosophizing 24-7. However, as agriculture became more widespread and farming allowed for a surplus of food and materials, some people were able to take on less productive roles, and thus we see the rise of people whose sole responsibility was telling stories. Now typically, especially in the early days, these people would also be religious figures. As these early societies developed, um, stories, religion, and music were all kind of lumped together into this category of ceremony. That's where you find the origins of music performance, dance, and theater, all kind of wrapped up into this early idea of faith. However, setting some people aside solely to work on this more ceremonial side of things allowed for more expansive stories than we had ever seen. The Epic of Gilgamesh is a great example of one that we still have record of today. The Epic is an honestly astonishingly complex work of literature written into clay tablets in Sumeria 4,000 years ago. And while the version that we have today is written, it's believed by scholars that it was first made and written to be performed orally, sung by a court singer and later recorded down by scribes. And so even with the oldest written epic in history, we can still see the, the vitality behind it. A human voice once sang these words, using their vast pre-existing knowledge of myth and histories and storytelling in order to weave together a tale that has stood the test of millennia. But storytellers were sacred and important in many different cultures, so before we talk specifically about bards, let's discuss some other traditions around the world that do kind of feed into the current cultural conception of a bard. From here going forward, I am going to issue a formal apology for any mispronunciations. Um, 
It is not my strong suit. In West Africa, their storytellers are called Jeli or Grio. Grio were a living archive for their communities, memorizing genealogies, histories, stories, and songs in order to mediate conflicts, advise rulers, and bring their community together. They used a combination of improvised poetry and music, usually accompanied by the sound of a kora or a balafon. The duty of a griot was usually inherited, as they tried to only marry and have children with other griots so that the knowledge could be passed down throughout the family. A griot would be associated with a particular community or ruler, and would sort of specialize in that community, acting as a true centerpiece for knowledge and cultural communication. Griots still exist today, blending ancient tales with modern knowledge. Many travel internationally, carrying on the tradition of sharing their stories and knowledge with a whole new generation. Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, people on the Polynesian islands were combining music and stories with a whole new medium dance. Hula dancing has a place in modern culture, but it originates from a much more ancient practice, which utilized chanting, drums, and careful movements of the body in order to tell stories. These stories had many different purposes, to honor rulers, to pay respect to animals and nature, and to explain ancient myths and legends. It was a religious ritual and entertainment all in one, inextricably linking stories to their faith. This ancient version of hula dancing, called hula kahiko, is still performed today, but those that practice it try to avoid, like, commercializing it or recording it in order to preserve as much of the original sanctity as they can. However, the modern form called hula awana has become a hallmark of Polynesian culture, especially the culture of the Hawaiian Islands. They still tell some of the same stories, but they've integrated modern instruments and melodies in order to make it more contemporary and to set it apart from the ancient religious practice. And finally, I'm going to talk about Japanese rakugo. Rakugo developed in the 17th century in Japan, and it was a way of telling comedic stories. It was kind of like a one-person sitcom, and the performance consisted of the performer, or the rakugoka, sitting in the center of the stage and not moving from that spot for the entirety of the story. They would perform all of the characters by themselves, and the only props that they had were a paper fan and a small cloth, which they could use to kind of imitate whatever items they might need. The stories were comedic, and sometimes a little bit educational, and sometimes they would lean even more heavily into sentimentality than comedy. But the focus was truly on the Rakugoka, the storyteller. Because of the simplicity and the lack of spectacle, it was entirely up to them to use the nuances of their performance and their simple skill in storytelling to engage the audience. Rakugo is still performed today, infusing centuries-old stories with modern ones, and it remains one of the most popular traditional Japanese performance arts to this day. Now, those three examples are really just a very small sample of a vast, varied, and incredibly fascinating storytelling tradition around the world. However, as I'm writing this script, this video has to be out in, um, yeah, four days, so alas, I must move on. So this brings us to the Western bardic tradition. I'd say that the primary inspiration for the modern concept of the bard. Ancient Greece established a strong tale-telling tradition with their traveling poet-singers called rhapsodes. The word rhapsode generally translates to one who sews songs together, which really emphasizes their role in the culture. They weren't like modern authors who are expected to turn out, you know, mostly original works. Rather, just like storytellers of old, they took in ancient tradition and stories and history, combined it in with their own experiences and thoughts in order to turn out a new story. Rhapsodes were known to travel far and wide, gathering in knowledge and worldly experience, and then using their poems and songs to show the average man just a glimpse of time and space. One of the most famous rhapsodes is Homer, the believed author of the Iliad and the Odyssey. These tales were transcribed down from the original performed versions, and they're still kicking around today, torturing 14-year-olds in their English classes across the world. But I think what's most fascinating about Homer is that he might not really have existed. It is entirely possible that Homer as a figure is 
just as mythic as the stories that he told, a way to kind of simplify the somewhat confusing process that these stories truly developed by being passed around and told by a thousand different voices across the world at once. But whether or not the actual blind poet-singer Homer truly walked this earth, he was a representation of the storyteller figure of the time, a wise person who was able to travel to gather knowledge and synthesize information in order to shape culture. Now jumping a few hundred years forward through time, we finally see the Bard. And there was some variation over what they called these guys across Europe. The Viking ones are called Skalds, and the ones assigned to specific courts were called Schopes, but all of these terms generally indicated the same kind of person, a traveling singer storyteller. And in the Middle Ages in particular, bards were crucial. Literacy was at an all-time low in the Middle Ages and was pretty much only reserved for the richest of the rich and religious scholars. However, the wealthy were primarily concerned with reading in order to conduct business, and those in monasteries and convents wanted to be able to write so that they could copy religious texts. Stories weren't generally regarded as like important enough to put down on paper, so it was up to bards to keep them alive. For the average peasant, a bard passing through was the only way for them to learn the full extent of ancient myths and histories, and for them to receive news from the outside world. Bards were entertainers, educators, and news reporters all at once, the only way for Europe to stay even somewhat connected before the rise of literacy and printing. And bards really wouldn't have been able to do any of this without music. Music was primarily used as a memorization tool. I have a, um, theater degree, so I probably shouldn't be trusted to get into the neurological nitty gritty, but I know that music sticks in your brain really well. The music and the notes, they, um... Okay, yeah, somebody just explain it in the comments for me if you know more than me. But basically, if you're trying to memorize the entirety of, like, Beowulf, for example, it's a lot easier to do that in the form of a song rather than a flat recitation. Plus, the addition of music makes storytelling much more engaging and easy to remember for an audience. So bards would have used their skill in music and storytelling to spread their knowledge of culture, stories, and just the outside world across a largely illiterate and non-globalized Europe. And while literacy would increase throughout Europe in the Renaissance era, the bard as a concept never truly left the public eye. In fact, William Shakespeare colloquially In fact, William Shakespeare colloquially I, I'm not literate. In fact, William Shakespeare, generally known as the bard, was called that for a very good reason. Shakespeare didn't necessarily, like, write original stories. Even ones like Romeo and Juliet, which now cannot be separated from his name, are based off of older stories, like the Greek tale of Pyramus and Thisbe. Shakespeare took these stories and spun them back out in his own voice and his own words in order to reinvent them for a new audience. He also wrote a whole slew of histories, which took actual historical events and peered at them through a modern, well, modern for the 16th century lens. It was the very definition of a bard, except for the fact that he didn't actually perform these words for himself. Even back in the 16th century, we can see the definition of a bard kind of start to loosen up and become more open to interpretation. And that brings us to the modern day, where, to be honest, there aren't a whole lot of like true bards running around. I honestly can't remember the last time a man with a lute jauntily strolled into my local palace and offered to sing me a ballad, unfortunately. But just as Shakespeare began to reinvent the role of the bard, I would argue that a lot of modern creators are beginning to reshape and repurpose the traditional role. There's obviously the go-to, musical performers. Many musicians integrate a kind of storytelling into their songs, whether it's their own personal experience or an invented one. And because in my opinion, no stories are truly original, I would say they're inevitably integrating more traditional stories into their songs. You can't tell me that Avril Lavigne's 2002 hit, Skater Boy, doesn't share some similarities 
with the 4,000 year old epic of Gilgamesh. Now, I I'm not trying to suggest that all musicians are truly bards, but I think that a lot of them do integrate some of the bardic traditional art into their modern craft. I would also say that some authors, even if they're not telling the tale out loud, have drawn from some aspects of the bardic tradition. And of course, um, you, you probably could have seen this coming, but I'm gonna bring up Tolkien here. He was deeply entrenched in European storytelling, and in his essay on fairy stories, he creates a metaphor that he calls the cauldron of story. This proposes that every story that's ever been told, whether it's the, the most real history or the most insane fairy tale, has been placed into the cauldron of story where it is melted down into separate elements. When a storyteller decides to write something new, they are scooping a few elements up out of the cauldron of story, reworking them for their own purposes, and then placing them back into the cauldron slightly changed and ready to be used again. King Arthur is a great example of this. He may have been an actual historical figure at some point, but at this point he's been plucked up out of the public consciousness and, and reworked and rewritten so many times that he's developed an entire character and lore beyond any of the original historical figure. This is essentially what bards have always done with stories, and it's what Tolkien claimed to do in his works. Middle-earth and the books written inside it were meant to be a new mythology for England, drawing from traditional legends, infusing them with his own knowledge and experiences in order to create something entirely new. So while Tolkien wasn't like a performer, per se, I would say that he's in the bardic tradition with the best of them, not chasing originality, but reshaping old tales for new minds. This third example may be a bit controversial, but I think that modern fan culture bears just a touch of bardic energy. Fan communities absorb a story told by someone else, and using their own worldviews and experiences, they churn out new art that adopts elements of the original while creating something very new. You can't tell me that the Ratatouille musical that TikTok made isn't, like, at least a little bit bardish. Fans are taking stories that they know and love and repurposing them, spreading them to new eyes and ears so that everyone can relish in the revitalized story. But bards also exist nearly in their original form in today's media. The character Yaskie, or Dandelion, from the Witcher franchise definitely comes to mind. Say what you will about the show, but he is a very fun example of the medieval bardic tradition. We get to see him take in the world around him and turn it into art. He's constantly seeking new stories, new knowledge, so that he can transform it and show it off to other people, and in that way, I think he does a really good job of showing what a bard is capable of. But I think my favorite bard from modern media is probably Tom Marilyn from the Wheel of Time series. Now, I, I actually have yet to read all of the Wheel of Time, so, you know, forgive me if I get anything wrong, but Tom is a gleeman. In his world, this makes him a traveling musician and entertainer and peddler of stories. More importantly, though, we get to see how the world around him reacts to him. Tom is a precious commodity, able to receive all kinds of special benefits because of how badly people want him to ply his craft. He is a paragon of history and news and entertainment, highly valued within the society for his memory and his skills. I think he is one of the purest representations of the bardic tradition in media. The bards have probably made their most distinct impact as one of the classes in video games and role-playing games, especially Dungeons and Dragons. They're known as one of the more difficult, but also one of the more rewarding classes to play. However, in my opinion, I don't think that D&D necessarily allows for the most faithful presentation of a bard. Out of all of the classes, I think it was definitely the hardest for them to gamify. The value of a bard comes from their knowledge, their impact on society, and the understanding that they have of culture. And that's a really hard thing to pin down into skill sets and points. They had to do things like add in some kind of combat ability and magical skills, both of which weren't necessarily present in the original bardic tradition. So while doing things like adding in the jack-of-all-trades feature, 
makes them a much more playable character class and comparable in skill to the other classes, I think it does allow players to miss the mark a little bit on what a bard is supposed to be. They weren't valued for their agility, or their bardic inspiration skills, or their ability to seduce anyone or anything. They were valued as shapers and communicators of history, stories, and culture. Now I will say that a more seasoned player may be perfectly fine creating a bard that wields their in-game knowledge and role-playing skills in order to fit the role of a traditional bard. But for a beginner player who's just imagining their character as uh, Ed Sheeran but hot, some of the nuance of the bard's original role can be lost. Bards are fascinating to me, but unfortunately, the role that they play in human culture is oftentimes breezed over. The fact is that without the artists, the storytellers, and the bards of the world, we wouldn't be where we are today. I loved making this video, and I'm definitely thinking of making it a series where I deconstruct and go into the history of each of the modern gaming classes. So let me know in the comments if you want to see that and what you'd want to see next. Next week's video is also going to be a super special celebration, and I'm going to be doing a little Q&A. So if you have any questions that you want to ask me about Lord of the Rings, the, the content that I make, or I guess my own personal life, feel free to drop them in the comments of this video or in the Google form that I'm putting in the description. Give this video a like if you learned something new, and subscribe if you want to join me every week for videos about fantasy, Tolkien, and storytelling, and we have a lot of fun over here. Thank you so, so much for watching, and I hope that you all have a very happy hoppity day. Mm -hmm.